Maria Soraya. We are here tonight at the Palos Verdes Golf Club to honor some very special teachers. It's Educator of the Year and it's an event sponsored by the Palos Verdes Peninsula Rotary Club. The Rotary Club's been doing this now for five years, so this is the fifth time that we, we put the program on. But Joan and I have been doing this now for quite a while, because we did it before under the auspices of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, what I like about the program is that it uh, picks ten of the top teachers on the peninsula, and you can think how many people are in that pool to be picked. There are a lot of people. And uh, see, these are the best of the best. So it's exciting to hear them talk about their experiences in a classroom and it's fun to hear what they have to say in terms of interactions with the kids. So we're here tonight, Joan, for Educator of the Year, and I know the Rotary works tirelessly to make sure that this all comes together. Tell, just tell us a little bit about that and wh what the Rotary does to prepare for this event. It's interesting that um, Jim Hartman, uh, I work with him as a co-chair for Educator of the Year, but I would say almost every single Rotarian in one way or another is involved in uh, making this event happen. How many people are in the group that work with you? Um, we have, uh, our committee varies, we have about 10 that are on our Educator of the Year committee, but for instance this afternoon we probably had 12, 13, 14 other Rotarian volunteers here setting up, doing the things that, uh, you know, just last minute uh, preparations, bringing things in together, uh, solving problems on the spot, and uh, it's really a, um, a reflection of what Rotary is. As you know, our uh, motto is service above of self and these are highly educated people successful professionals and they're putting the programs on the table or arranging little things but very willing to do it all all to make it so that we beautifully honor uh, these outstanding educators in our community you know we are so lucky to have so many outstanding educators how are they selected for the awards uh, it's rather interesting uh, of course we include both public and private uh, schools and uh, each institution uh, can determine who they wish to choose. Many of them, uh, the staff actually votes and um, that is very esteeming for the honoree to be chosen by their peers. Um, in the public schools, uh, they rotate because there are so many public schools. So every year it's one high school from the district, one intermediate school, and then uh, two elementary schools, one teacher from the lower kindergarten first second I believe the lower part of elementary and then another teacher from uh, third fourth and fifth uh, so it, it they each kind of have a chance as the years go by and this is the 33rd year of our event you know, it's interesting I, I've been to a couple of these events and it's just so amazing teachers work so hard that they are honored and people recognize their all the work that they put in to their everyday work. This is um, probably one of the reasons why we do this is that uh, to hear these teachers express their love of teaching and their extreme dedication to the profession. I think that um, these teachers, they go to, to school every day. They're, not only are they teaching the subject, but they're managing a lot of things in the classroom with a variety of students at a variety of different learning levels. And then they go home and they grade papers and work on lesson plans and work on the weekend so um, I think this is just very small what we can do to honor them for their great work. So Walker we're here of course to to really honor our educators. This is such a special night for people that are so dedicated. No you're absolutely right we probably don't recognize them enough of the hard work and the dedication they put into it so this is actually and I say this over and over it's like one of the more memorable evenings of the year I really I really do enjoy it to get out and say thank you. When we think about the different educators and how they're selected I mean, there's so many great ones. How do they choose? Actually, it's really tough, especially in a district where we have probably between 500 and 600 teachers. The principals argue it over it. We go through the selection process, you know, and you probably have, you know, 30 other people that could be recognized this evening, but we have to narrow it down. It's hard. It really is. We have a lot of great teachers. You know, you've got to be so proud as superintendent to be in this district. You know, it, it's an outstanding district. And, and I mean, uh, are there things that we are looking forward to in the future improving on, but it's an outstanding district. So it's, and it really is coming.
come down to teamwork like the Rotary Club and everybody else that's involved about making us great. You know, we had just talked to Joan from the Rotary Club and they work so tirelessly to make sure this event comes through and everybody comes. This is one of the most popular events I think we do. Well, yeah, it's actually Jim, Harmon and Joan. I They come every year. They get this organized. It's amazing. I we got to applaud them for the work they do to make this event take place. Okay. Is this your first Educator of the Year as principals, all right? That's right. First Educator of the Year and uh, just by looking at this, it's such a, a great event. The Rotary, they do a great job. So professional and uh, what how lucky are we to be here? Well, really, we're here, of course, to honor all the great teachers and their work. And this event is always so popular in this community because we have so many great educators. Just talk about that. Well, we're here to honor for Palos Verdes High School, Jim Whalen. He's one of our best and brightest teachers, avid teacher, math teacher, and he's being honored by his peers. So I'm really proud of him. Now, there, we hear that all of the principals have to argue over which teacher gets what. How do you decide? And that's the toughest thing. I, I take it to my staff. I say, let's vote for our teacher of the year, and then it takes about a good month to figure out who it is, but it's a vote. And Jim William was selected by his peers and colleagues, so what an honor. It says a lot about him, too. Is this your first Educator of the Year as principals, all right? That's right. First Educator of the Year, and uh, just by looking at this, it's such a, a great event. The Rotary, they do a great job. So professional, and uh, what, how lucky are we to be here? On behalf of the Rotary Club of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Educator of the Year Awards Banquet. My name is Jim Hartman and I serve with Joan Behrens. She and Joan and I have been doing this for quite a while for tonight's event. This is actually the 33rd annual awards program and the fifth year our, our Rotary Club is hosting this event, this wonderful event at the PV Golf Club, a beautiful venue. I'm so pleased that our community celebrates publicly the teaching profession. Such appreciation of and respect for teaching is a tradition, a rich tradition on the peninsula. In honoring our teachers, we in, indeed all honor all constituents who are associated with the schools. We honor their students, their students' progress. We honor their parents, the principals and their staff, the donors and the respective trustees who support the schools. Actually, our own dreams as individuals began with a teacher Somebody who believed that we could do it. The teachers we honor this evening are the believers. They're the caring builders in our society. They're the optimists. They're the kind heroes. They're guides and inspiration to our children. They are the only, they are the role models and they lead the way. Those we honor are the best and they are that way because they teach from the heart. They care. Let's applaud our recipients who are the winners tonight. I want to thank the jazz group, Kane's Combo. I don't know, is Ari there? Is, I think they're actually packing up their equipment now. Yeah, why don't you come on in, you guys, and get be introduced here. These young men are students of PV High School, and they're incredible musicians. I'll ask them to raise their hands when I introduce them. So is Ari here? Is Ari here? Ari. Okay. Um, then Max, Max Vedloff on the saxophone, Aaron Sverdloff on the bass, and Ben Semmel on the drums. So we thank you for your outstanding music during the free event reception. I'll turn it over now to Joan. I too would echo what Jim has said about this wonderful event to honor the educators in this community. They mean so much to us and certainly um, we take our hats off to them for all that they do. And now the presentation of the colors by Boy Scout Troop 134, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Color Guard attention. Color Guard forward march. Will the audience please rise. Color Guard halt. Color Guard post the colors. 
Will the audience please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. The audience may be seated. Color guard dismissed. Let's give our scouts a round of applause. The Saints, the local church, along with scouts from throughout this church, are celebrating 100 years of the church's affiliation with the Boy Scouts of America. Thank you so much. Now for several years, we've had Bruce Attic come and do the invocation, so he's here tonight. So one more time, Bruce. If you all be kind enough to bow your heads and join me in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, in looking around the room, I'm reminded of all the numerous blessings we've been honored to receive. We're fortunate to be born in a country where education is not just offered to every person, but also encouraged. To live in a region offering numerous choices of schools, staffed with teachers and administrators who generally concern about our youth's well-being. To study in an economically advantaged community where our children are not in constant fear of violence and our residents are quick to lend support to help with the educational programs. So we give you thanks for all these wonderful opportunities that we so often take for granted. And we ask for your continued blessings on all the valued educators and especially those we're honoring here tonight. Please continue to nurture their desire to instruct, inspire, and mentor our young people. And we ask that you give them patience, insight, and joy as they perform the most important roles in our community. Thank you for all this and all the many blessings that you graciously bestow upon us each and every day. Amen. Thanks, Joan. Good evening, everybody. My name is Susie Zimmerman, and I am the current president of this great group of Palos Verdes Peninsula Rotarians. Uh, personally, I am so proud to be part of this event. It's my favorite event. Um, recognizing all of you, uh, you see my mom was an educator for over 20 years, impacting many lives just like you do. And that might not have been the case if it wasn't for some kind high school teacher who reached out to her, explained the college application process, and helped her secure a scholarship. There's never enough recognition for the work that you all do, so please accept my personal thank you. As many of you know, our Rotary Club has been sponsoring college scholarships for students on the peninsula for a number of years now. I'm pleased to announce that focused interest and local support for this event, which recognizes outstanding teaching on the peninsula, has generated support for 10 scholarships available to graduating seniors in our local area. We will use these funds to enable bright, qualified students who need assistance to attend college. At this time, I'd like to recognize and thank our sponsors, whose names are also listed in your printed program. I would like to draw special attention to our largest donors, Mr. Kim from the Palace Verdes Estates and Hang Up Moon, a fellow Rotarian from Rolling Hills. I also wish to recognize our honorary sponsor, the Torrance Memorial Hospital Foundation, whose generous, <laughs> whose generous support included the funding of the Dinners for our Educators of the Year recipients and their spouses. In addition, a special thank you to the Southern California Edison Group for providing support for a new STEM scholarship program. I will now reference the names of those sponsors who, out of respect for the teaching profession, have made generous donations in support of our Rotary Club Scholarship Program. Sponsors, please stand as your name is read, and audience, please hold your, response, or your applause until the conclusion of the recipient's names. 
DK Kim Foundation, Southern California Edison, Hang Up Moon Tritus Inc., Torrance Memorial Healthcare Foundation, John Cameron, Matson Foundation, State Farm Insurance, Jackie and Roger Ignon, Toyota Motor USA, Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center, Bob and Gail Johnson, Bob and Susie Gulcher, Bruce and Lynn Attic, Susie Zimmerman, State Farm Insurance, Alan Bond, Bank of America, Cox Cable, Keith Dysonroth and Associates, Les Fishman and Virginia Butler, Caldwell Banker, Christina Barnicky, David Rowe, Jet Forwarding, Paul Rubencam, Jim Hartman, Joan Behrens, Greg and Carolyn O'Brien, Premier Bank, Malaga Bank, Norton Donner, Cal Water Services Company, Harry Kidder, CPA, PFS, Kim Lynch, John Shurick, PV Engineering, Sean Najad, RPV Flowers, Peter McCormick, Alan Coleman, Nikki Nikitar, Carolyn Lair, Menoir Fine Jewelers, The Spa at Terranea Resort. It's pretty impressive. I would also like to make a special acknowledgement of Robert Medawar, owner of Medawar Fine Jewelers. He facilitated the beautiful carriage clocks for each outstanding educator. We also would like to recognize fellow Rotarian Sean Najad from RPV Flowers for his centerpiece contributions, as well as Greg Sparkman, president of Creative Partners Group, for all his creative graphic designing for this event. Thank you, everybody. Again, if you can hold, hold your applause as I've introduced some special people that were involved in the planning of the activity tonight, this event, namely. Members of the 2013 Rotary Educator of the Year Committee, please stand. Bruce Attic, Harry Kidder, Liz Fitzgerald, Bob Galcher, Susie Zimmerman, Les Fishman, Keith Thiessenroth, Greg Sparkman, Julia Parton, and James Morgan. In addition, almost every member of our Rotary Club has been involved in the planning and presentation of this event. Uh, thanks to each of you and all of you. Thank you very much. As previously mentioned, this is the 33rd Annual Educator of the Year event here on the peninsula. Let's acknowledge all past Educators of the Year who may be here with us this evening. Please stand and let's give them a round of applause. our educators in the past two years are receiving an Educator of the Year pins. Thank you. We will now have a special introduction of our elected and community officials. Again, please hold your applause until everyone has been introduced. John Ray, Palos Verdes Estates City Council Member. Rosemary Humphrey, Palos Verdes Estates City Council Member and Principal of Rancho Del Mar High School. Kathy Gold, Palos Verdes Peninsula Library Director. Fran Whelan, President of the Board of the Library Trustees and Editor of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Coordinating Council Calendar. David Lidgair, representing California State Senator Ted Liu. Walker Williams, Superintendent, Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District. Malcolm Sharp, member of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District. Eileen Hupp, President and CEO of the Palos Verdes Chamber of Commerce and fellow Rotarian. Mary Jane Shaneheider, editor of Peninsula People Magazine and a fellow Rotarian. And Meredith Grenier, esteemed writer from the Daily Breeze. You may be seated, thank you. Because of the leadership and generosity of Susie Zimmerman, the members of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Rotary Club, and all of the generous sponsors, 
we continue to have the opportunity to recognize and thank the outstanding educators in our community. I also want to take the time because I know these kind of events don't happen by accident and I, it's truly important to recognize the people who pull this off. And I want to thank Joan Behrens and Jim Hardman for all the hard work and dedication that every year goes into community this together. So thank you. Every year, local school leaders in Palos Verdes go through the difficult process of choosing an educator of the year. In the PVPUS alone, there are hundreds of teachers every day doing wonderful things with students in the classroom. We've been able to narrow it down. It's a very difficult task, but we've been able to narrow it down to a handful of special teachers that will be honored and recognized at this dinner. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats once said, education is not filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Tonight, as with past years, we're recognizing teachers that have lit the fire for thousands of students in this community. In a few moments, when the honorees are introduced and their many accomplishments are described, you'll be inspired by their dedication to students and the teaching profession. But one of the things I enjoy doing at each one of these, as in the past, the principals, the presidents, the administrators, and headmasters from the school will introduce the honorees. These individuals are also an impressive group of educational leaders who take a great deal of pride in honoring the all-stars in our community. And as I call their name and I'd like to recognize them, I'd like to recognize my colleagues to stand for a moment and be, and be introduced, and as you I know, you'll have a later opportunity to introduce the honorees. So starting in this, the order that they'll present, Patricia Collier, the head of school for Peninsula Heritage, if you could stand. I don't, I don't believe Ted Hill from Chadwick is here tonight, but we still need to do a shout out for him, the great work Chadwick School is doing. Major Tim Foley, the College for Officers Training at Crestmont. Dr. Ariane Shower, the Vice President of Marymount College. The next, the next four are part of my team, so I'm especially proud of them. Jane Tasker, our new principal of Silver Spur Elementary School. Bill McDonald, our new principal of Rancho Vista Elementary School. Kevin Allen, the principal of Merrill Less Intermediate, is an old timer, but he's here. And Dr. Charles Park, principal of Palos Verdes High School. Peter McCormick, the headmaster of Rolling Hills Prep. And Anne Marie Hudani from St. John Fisher. So once again, I just want to thank you for all you do for students in this community. And again, I really truly want to thank the Peninsula Rotary Club for organizing this event. And on behalf of all the educators in the Palos Verdes community, congratulations to the honorees. So thank you. Thank you, Walker. It's um, certainly a pleasure to uh, work with you and have your uh, enthusiasm for this event. We are now ready to begin the presentation of the honorees. In order to provide sufficient time for all presenters and honorees to speak and recognizing that this is a school night, we ask that presenters and honorees speak for no more than a combined total of six minutes. Honorees, if you see someone hovering to your left, that would be Mr. Hartman indicating that your time is up. Please be aware also that this program and your remarks are being recorded and will be televised on local television, RPV TV. Thanks to the generosity of Medawar Fine Jewelers, each honoree will receive one of these beautiful Seiko carriage clocks. They will also receive an Educator of the Year pin designed by our fellow Rotarian, Greg Sparkman of Creative Partners Group, and compliments of Terranea Resort, a one-day pass for two to the spa at Terranea. Honorees <laughs> at... Honorees, at the conclusion of your remarks here at the podium, please pause a moment and allow Mr. Sp Mr. Hartman or myself to give you your awards. We now ask that our honorees and presenters refer to the back of your printed program for the order of presenting. 
as the school preceding you is about to begin, the next school's presenter and honoree should step forward and be ready and be seated here adjacent to the program for your presentation. So let's begin with Rancho Vista Elementary School. Uh, we begin by honoring Rancho Vista, an outstanding neighborhood participation school, opened in 1961. This is a kindergarten through fifth grade public school in Rancho Palos Verdes with an enrollment of 457 students. Please welcome the principal, Bill McDonald. Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen, Rotary Club members, thank you for having us this evening. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Allison Palmer. Allison is truly an incredible person, and as such, a mythology has already developed around her. Tonight I will do my best to stick to the facts. Allison began teaching at Brasco High School. At Bosco, Allison was selected as the lead reading teacher and created a cutting-edge curriculum in reading that is still in use today. In 2008, Allison made the wise decision to come to PVEP USD, where she taught fourth grade at Silver Spur and collaborated with her team to develop an outstanding student writing program. About that time, Allison's obvious excellence caught the eye of Rancho Vista's talent scouts. And this is where things get really interesting. Allison was actively recruited by Rancho Vista in 2009, signed a 30-year, $30 million contract with the renowned school, which of course, principles, means you can never have her, ever. <laughs> During donning her Roadrunner baseball cap, Allison charged into kindergarten and had an incredible three-year stint that was characterized by high expectations, accelerated student achievement, hugs, and smiles. Due to her influence on kindergarten at Rancho Vista and throughout the civilized world, the popular call for kindergarten students to sit with their legs crossed on the rug, crisscross applesauce, was reworked in Allison's honor to be crisscross Allison Rocks, which it remains to this day. The following year, Allison got the call to move up to the big leagues. She worked as a response to instruction teacher in the Roadrunner Academy, and she had a tremendous impact on the learning of all the students. For the past two years, Allison has successfully taught fourth grade, and during this time, the students in fourth grade with the rest of her team have achieved over 95% proficiency and advanced on their math and ELA CSTs, a remarkable achievement. If this were not enough, Allison has served as the staff advisor for the Rancho Vista Student Council for the past five years. Under her guidance, the council has evolved into an outstanding leadership development group that includes character building, mentoring, and community outreach. Graduates of the program, albeit only 10 years old, have been, have been recruited by Fortune 500 companies and are frequently absent but on independent study due to their various consulting contracts. Allison also serves on the school curriculum leadership team and as a district representative for the curriculum instruction team. You would think with all this going on, the success would go to Allison's head, but she remains as grounded as this Persian carpet. Just listen to what her peers have to say about Allison. We are fortunate to have Allison as part of our team. Her passion and work brighten our walls, our hearts, and our minds. Allison has that certain something. She is humble, kind, and funny. She has an old soul quality so rarely found in a person so young. She is child-centered, a devoted mom, and an amazing teacher. Allison is an exceptional individual who brightens the day for all around her. Allison is like a breath of fresh air. She always has a smile on her face and something positive or funny to share. She is so sweet, loving, and caring to all her students. I always felt that my child was her favorite, but I really think she made all of us feel that way. I like that one. But this is my personal favorite. Children run to hug her. So children run to hug her. And this is the truth. Allison radiates warmth and kindness, and that is why children flock to her. It is also what makes her a highly effective and special teacher, one who is well deserving of the honor of Teacher of the Year. Congratulations, on Allison. We are so proud to know you and have you as part of our team. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> It seems surreal to be standing up here today, and it's such an honor. When I look back at my own elementary experience, 
the grade I hated the most was fourth grade. And it's <laughs> bizarre to be standing here and to know that I'm a fourth grade teacher. And I do everything I can to make sure that I make an, a positive impact on my students. David Letterman did a list on the top 10 reasons to become a teacher a few years ago. And while I won't read the entire list, I wanted to point out a couple of my favorites. His 10th reason was big bucks. I think everyone in this room can agree we all went into teaching for big bucks. <laughs> His sixth reason was free apples. I do get some of those when the cafeteria offers them. And then his, number two was leisurely summers in intensive therapy attempting to recover strength for the next term. <laughs> teaching isn't an easy job by any means, but it's a job I'm so proud to have, and I've really had to fight hard to keep. Teaching is my passion, and I'm so lucky to say I'm a teacher. What other jobs allow you to see a child progress and evolve? I'm sorry. <laughs> my students are my family. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I love, I love bringing my own personality and style into my classroom. I'm not just a teacher, I'm a motivational speaker, a stand-up comedian, I'm a singer, songwriter, a rapper, and a writer. I'm a storyteller, I'm a therapist, I can sing you a radio jingle about photosynthesis, or, or make up acronyms like nobody's business. My students are expecting to be entertained, and they want to be entertained daily. The intangible awards also. How many careers do you, I mean, how many jobs are there that actually give you compliments on a daily basis? Um, my students will tell me when they like a lesson I'm doing. They'll also tell me when they like my hair. They'll also tell me when they don't like some things. But their enthusiasm and their honesty is what I love the most. Um, lastly is inspiration. Do I feel that I inspire my students? Yes. Do I do it every day? Probably not but I know that I'm making a difference in this crazy world and this community. And as te teachers, we face challenges every day, but I truly give my best to each one of my students because watching them grow and learn is the greatest gift of all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to thank the people who support me the most and who have made it better. You know, no matter how many times you practice, it doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> to my husband, <laughs> you are a huge support to me. <laughs> and I, you've guided me, we've grown up together. You've guided me through this whole process. And I'm so lucky to have you. Thank you, I love you. <laughs> to my mom, an educator of over 35 years, you inspired me to go into this career and I'm grateful for that. To my dad and Debbie, you are so motivating to me and have encouraged me every step of the way. Told me never to give up after all of those pink slips. <laughs> so, <laughs> also to my son, he's two, and because of him, I'm a better teacher. I have much more compassion, much more patience, and much more love because he taught me how to be on the other side. It's so easy to be the teacher, so much harder to be a parent and a teacher. <laughs> I've got to give a shout out to my Rancho Vista family. I love you guys. <laughs> you, there are no words how thankful I am to have you all in my life. You are my second family and my home away from home. I'm so thankful for my fourth grade team, Alex and Laura. <laughs> You've made me a stronger teacher and I can't thank you enough for sharing your lessons and ideas and bringing me in onto your team. On a final note, I'm so honored to be a part of the Palos Verdes Unified School District. And it's a, we have an incredible faculty here. Thank you very much. Thank you, I can't thank you enough for this wonderful award. Thank you. I'm pleased at this time to introduce the training principal from the College for Officer Training at Crestmont. The Salvation Army Training College, which has been here on the peninsula since 1975, offers an accredited two-year associate degree in ministry. This year, enrollment's over 105 cadets. And here, here to introduce their honoree is a previous Educator of the Year recipient, a Rotarian, and the principal, Major Tim Foley. I'm Jim's boss, so he's going to give me extra time. <laughs> no way. No way. He's a, he's, a, he's a hard guy. Well, tonight, the Salvation Army and the College for Officer Training here, here in uh, Palos Verdes, we, we honor 
our, li our librarian and museum curator, Sheila Chatterjee. She is a wonderful person, a teacher's teacher, and our students just love her. Sheila's been working in the field of library sciences for over 20 years in a variety of locations. She obtained her undergraduate degree in Latin and English from the University of Minnesota and a master's in library science from Catholic University where she was an intern at the Library of Congress. She considers herself a lifelong student, student and is currently pursuing a certificate in college counseling from UCLA. Her main focus throughout her educational career has been meeting the needs of students. Sheila joined us at the Salvation Army in June, I think it was June or so, around 2011, and she quickly went to work. She has received high marks of appreciation from our students, and she's a joy to work with with our staff. She makes herself available and is always going the extra mile for each and every student. She actually was my student as I taught Old Testament. She wanted to basically understand the Old Testament and understand what, what in the world these students were uh, learning and how I was teaching them. Uh, she was a very good student. She got all A's. But um, I think I had to give them to her, but no, anyways. <laughs> Sheila took on an additional role uh, as soon as she came uh, as the chair of our ACCJC WASC steering committee for our self-study. Those of you that have been through the accreditation process understand how complex that is. We've just completed our peer evaluation site visit with the accrediting team. Sheila's work was monumental and we owe her a great deal of uh, gratitude for her work. The Salvation Army honors Sheila Chatterjee and along with her friends and her family here tonight and part of our staff, we pay tribute to this wonderful person who always has the motto of the Salvation Army in mind others. She is an other-driven person, and we thank you, Sheila, for all your wonderful work that you've done, and you will continue to do. So, it's all yours. Thank you, Major Foley, and uh, thank you, Rotary. Uh, as Major Foley mentioned, I teach a course in information literacy. Uh, this includes instruction on um, finding, evaluating, uh, integrating, and citing information. So the dreaded MLA format and <laughs> essentially anything you have to do to write, or our cadets have to do, or students have to do to write research papers for the two years that they're with us. A couple of years ago, I uh, started hearing about this um, concept of flipped classrooms, and I thought it would be a really great format for the classes that I teach. Um, what I would hope to do, what I hope to do is uh, create some videos on information literacy, have the students watch them as their homework, and then come to class to do their homework. Because the challenge really is when you're doing your homework, if you have a question, you're alone, right? So um, I wanted to turn my classes into labs and turn the homework into the lecture format. But uh, as Major Foley mentioned, <laughs> Uh, I was heavily involved in accreditation, and my time for the last year and a half was really absorbed by this accreditation process. And then finally, the summer, when things slowed down a bit, I received this email from one of the information vendors about a free searchable database of information literacy videos uh, and created by librarians. And so I jumped right in, changed my syllabus over the summer, and um, took on this flipped classroom approach. So my students now, Every week I send them videos, they watch their lectures, and then they come to class and we all, after a brief lecture and an introduction to an assignment, um, we, they have a lab. And it's been a really um, positive and kind of affirming uh, ex experience for me and I think for the students. Now one of the things that I've seen in all the literature on um, flipped classrooms and the studies that they're doing on them is that it takes committed, engaged students. And this is where I get to the part where I think I, could, I feel like I could cheer up because our students are unbelievably committed. <laughs> they are these uh, people who've given up everything in their lives uh, to come and uh, work as cadets and then two years later become um, uh, officers of the Salvation Army. And it's, when I um, came to the Salvation Army, I didn't realize everything they did. All I knew were the um, thrift stores, right? 
So <laughs> it's incredible to, uh, to see what's behind uh, the, um, the red shield, essentially. These uh, cadets, when they become officers, will go out and serve the community by um, helping the elderly, by counseling the addicted, by supporting families of limited means, by fighting human trafficking. And it's really incredible to be part, a small part of that process. The slogan of the Salvation Army is doing the most good. And I feel like in a small way, working with them, I'm kind of part of that work. So um, thank you, uh, Rotary. And thank you, uh, Major Foley, for making it possible for me to be part of such a wonderful organization. The next presenter will be from Peninsula Heritage School, located in Rolling Hills Estates. This independent, nonprofit kindergarten through sixth grade school was founded in 1961 and serves 108 students. It is my pleasure to introduce the head of school, Patricia Kaye. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Rotary of Peninsula for the peninsula, for what you're doing tonight. It's such a worthy cause and I appreciate it very much. And I appreciate all of you for the educators that do so much for our community. I'd like to thank um, Ms. Joan Behrens and Les Fishman for their support of Peninsula Heritage School. They do beautiful things for us and we thank them. <laughs> Is Les here? Is Mr. Fishman here? I don't think so. Anyway, thank you, Les. Um, tonight, I would like to introduce our physical education teacher, Mrs. Kim Nygaard. She's been with us for 28 years, and that fact alone, she needs an award. Um, to be at the same school and to be making a difference for so many years is um, a very wondrous thing, especially in a tiny little school. Um, Kim is a silver medalist in crewing. She is an athlete from the top of her head to the bottom of her toes. Um, she has changed Peninsula Heritage entire physical education program. She wrote a book on Survivor, PE style, so don't think we do that at our school. Um, and no one ever gets off the team. But she has made the children look forward to that year after year. Um, she has introduced lacrosse and archery. She has hosted fundraisers for the school. She's written plays, trying to think of all the wonderful things. She's out of the box person and has such an effect on children. She has a whistle that I envy so much. With those two fingers, she can get the attention of the entire school. You don't have to do this. You don't have to ring a bell, you just go to and she does it. So that's a beautiful thing for her. But um, besides all of that, there's something about her that is very dear to my heart, is that she can train athletes and the wonderful children that you all know that are very much endowed with athletics. But the thing that she does that always touches my heart is that she looks at the little kid that will never be an athlete and looks at them and she makes them believe that they are an athlete and she loves them and she encourages them and if they can't skip, they learn to skip with her. And to me, that's the true gift of teaching. And so it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Mrs. Kim Nygaard from Peninsula Heritage School. Oh, I just wanted to get up here and whistle, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I do want to thank everybody. Um, you have to whistle. You'll hear it. <laughs> Maybe when I'm sitting over there. But you know, tonight really I feel is not just about me or just about um, you know my award, but my little table over there with the Peninsula Heritage School. Those are my friends who are also educators, and I think we all belong in the same box, just like you guys do out there. You know, day after day we go to our jobs. I have the best job in the world because I get to play with the children, and there's nothing better than that. Um, we have challenges at school, we have challenges in our classes, but you know what, that's what makes us better. That's what makes us better educators because we're able to really work and see through children's eyes what their problems are. They might not be a problem to us or we might not really think that it's a big problem, but to them it is. 
So being able to get them more self-aware, uh, build their self-confidence, learn how to lose. We do that at our school. I set the kids up to lose. So they learn how to lose and how not to just always get an award for something. Because sometimes when everybody's special, there's never one person that really is. So what we have to do is we have to really teach these children that when they go out there, they try their very best and they do what they can. Um, the survivor program that Mrs. Kaya was talking about was, I, I love Survivor, and um, the reality show. And I did bring that to our school. And I think about 12 years ago when it started, um, I sat in the graduation and the fifth graders, every single fifth grader mentioned Survivor. And I thought, whoa. You know, sometimes as educators, you just don't know if your programs are gonna work or what you're gonna do. You know, you always have to have that backup plan. You have to be flexible, you have to be kind, you have to know what you're doing, and you have to just say, hey, didn't work today, let's try something else. Just like, you didn't win today, let's work on it tomorrow. So I think what happens is when I heard every child mention Survivor, I thought, whoa, this made a difference. And with Survivor, I've been able to bring in math, geography, um, balance, strength, you know, so we do have challenges, they get put into tribes, and we do it every year, so it's really fun. From there, I wrote a book on Survivor, it's called Survivor PE Style, and then I also offer summer camps. And so the summer camps just keep growing and growing and growing, and so now the alumni want to have an alumni summer camp of Survivor. So, you know, I think, I think just these little things that you get from the children, um, you know, we know what we do, we know how good we can do things, we know our faults, we know, you know, being able to be a teacher is something that's a gift. And I think that being a gift, we get that from the children. And I just want to say thank you to everybody, and I want to say thank you again to my supporters over there, and to some of you guys in the room that I've seen before, and to Mrs. Kaye. Thank you. Uh, Chadwick School's next. Founded in 1935, offers K through 12 programs to its 850 students, and this year is celebrating 77 years of service. School's in its fourth or fifth year of operation at Song. I don't know what is it, fourth or fifth, fourth, fourth, um, which is their new international campus in Songdo, South Korea. Uh, that's where Ted Hill is actually at the moment. Presenting honoree for Chadwick is their assistant head for academic affairs, Dr. Deborah Dowling. Excited to introduce Chadwick's Teacher of the Year, Kate Alordegi. As a classroom teacher, Kate's integrity and her professionalism are remarkable. She has a really genuine enthusiasm and a real interest in listening to students' ideas. And combining those two traits kind of catches the students up and it carries them forward intellectually. But it's not just the classroom teaching. Kate stands out because she's so much more than an excellent English teacher. Kate's completely committed to educating the whole child. I saw this the very first time I saw her teach. She was returning tests to middle schoolers and she turned that logistical process into a lesson about etiquette and compassion. Over the years, she's been involved in almost every aspect of student life at Chadwick, from outdoor education to publications, from the student assistance team to Model United Nations. And just as she sees herself as the educator of the whole child, Kate sees herself as a member of the whole school community. Since she joined us in 2004, Kate has been active on committees from admissions through school policy reviews to college counseling. She leads her peers. She has been a department chair. She spearheads new initiatives and she rides the waves of new ideas. Kate's view extends far beyond the school gates too. Kate travels abroad with our students. She leads collaborative student projects with our South Korean campus. She's a world traveler herself, and she leads our students to be global citizens. Kate educates the whole child within the whole school with a view to the whole world. And as it turns out, three days ago, she produced a whole child. <laughs> Sebastian Alortigi was born on Sunday, <laughs> so Kate's award will be accepted on her behalf by her department chair, Stephen Sowell. <laughs> I 
I assume some of you thought something was suspicious when you saw <laughs> Kate sitting there. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to accept this award on her behalf. I actually co-teach seventh grade with Kate and I have for several years. She's an awesome, remarkable person. Adjectives that come to mind when I think about her are grace and integrity and professionalism. And she regularly inspires me to be a, not only a better teacher, but a better person. So again, it's, it's a tremendous honor for me to do this. Thank you very much. Our next school to be recognized is Silver Spur Elementary School in Rancho Palos Verdes with a student enrollment this year of 664 students. Here to introduce the honoree is Silver Spur's principal, Jane Tasker. Jane. Thank you and good evening. My name is Jane Tasker and I'm the very proud principal of Silver Spur Elementary School. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District Employee of the Year for the primary grades, Ms. Mindy Castillo. Ms. Castillo has committed 13 years of service to the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District. As a teacher at Silver Spur, she has been an inspiration to students, parents, and fellow staff. And even myself, just in the last few months, um, as a new principal at Silver Spur, she was one that stood out to me from the very beginning as so giving of her time. We all know that time is limited, and uh, I think it was the first or second day, Mindy, she spent um, countless minutes with me in the multi-purpose room helping me figure out the PA, and <laughs> she had plenty of things get, to get ready in her classroom, but it was definitely a moment that stood out to me, and then over the last few months, I've definitely gotten to know her on a better, deeper level. So a few of the things that I'd like to highlight tonight um, are her passion for 21st century learning. She has been able to lead technology improvements at our school, including the innovative use of iPads as an instructional tool. Ms. Castillo is a visionary teacher leader in many other areas that have reached the entire campus and not just her classroom. She was instrumental in getting our Reading Counts program up and running and was the driving force for starting the Incentive and Student Recognition Assemblies. In addition to all of this, Ms. Castillo listens to her students, challenging them along the way to be better. Not just better students, but better friends and better citizens. Her students respect this and grow to be more confident and ready for the future. We feel it is an honor to work with her, and the Silver Spur community is very fortunate to have her. I would like to thank the PV Peninsula Rotary for allowing us this opportunity to celebrate her and thank her friends and family for joining us tonight. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Mindy Castillo. Thank you, Jane, very much. Um, so when we do school plays in the elementary school level, we usually have our students stand on stage and give our thanks for us and half of me wanted to do that tonight. <laughs> um, this might sound crazy, but I have to say I believe teaching is something I was born to do. When you consider the fact that my aunt, uncle, and cousin are educators, my dad wanted to be a professor at one point in his life, and my mom is currently a librarian, well, it's almost like teaching is in my blood. My parents believed I could be anything I set my mind to. My parents were my very first supporters, and I'm going to call them my first multipliers. Why? This term comes from the book, Multipliers, how the best leaders make everybody smarter. A multiplier is a leader who is no longer the genius in the room, but instills belief in genius in others. That describes my parents to a T. They believed in me and to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mom, and to Dad. Um, my philosophy as an educator comes straight from Multipliers, yet I only recently discovered this book. Multipliers describes the many people in my life who have believed in me, starting with my parents. Later in high school, I met Mrs. Lopez, a, mul a multiplier at work in the classroom. I started her English class being an apprehensive writer, which didn't last for long. Mrs. Lopez would take my work, read it aloud, and make it live. She saw the voice in every child. She believed in her students and believed in the potential within each child. 
I left Mrs. Lopez's classroom feeling like a writing genius, and I, in turn, strive to do that for my students. The beautiful individuals walking through my classroom doors each year have an unlimited supply of potential. And not only do they have potential, but they walk through my room with a life story to tell. I have learned just as much, if not more, from my students than they have learned from me. One previous student in my class, here from Japan, gave me a written note saying, quote, on the first day I met you, I thought you were a strict teacher. Room 12 was like rainforest because it was filled with frogs. Do you know the Japanese word for frog is kairu? Kairu also means return. On a side note, he also wrote, I thought your running gear was very cool and the right color for you. <laughs> <laughs> Kairu, I had no idea this word had two meanings in Japan. More than anything, the student's note made me laugh and smile and still does. Needless to say, I have gained and learned so much as a teacher, which is more than I could give to my students. I have seen kids shine on stage, even when there were doubts from others that a child with an IEP facing many challenges could do it. I have seen kids return to Japan after spending a few years in the United States. I have cared for my students when we've had lockdowns. I have had a student with a restraining order against an alcoholic parent. I have seen a student face leukemia and fight his way through to remission. I have seen a student dealing with the fact that her mom is facing early Parkinson's. Some students have seen their parents fight cancer and face other struggles that life throws at us. As a teacher, I am not just teaching academics. I am teaching and caring for the whole child. It's my job to make sure my students leave my classroom feeling like geniuses, confident and secure in their abilities. Coming back to what brings me here today, I am standing here because I have been surrounded by multipliers in my life. People who believed in me and my potential. Kristen Gagnon is a current multiplier in my life. She gave me the confidence to write school grants and helped me to reevaluate my teaching pedagogy more than once while being my teaching partner and friend. Jen Wade, again, is a multiplier in my life and a friend. She brought me to the college level to teach for summer, believing in my abilities. To my colleagues, Kristen and Jen, thank you so much. At Silver Spur, I feel so blessed to work with amazing, amazing teachers. They have helped to shape me as an educator. It's an extreme honor to know that they were behind my nomination. To the Palos Verdes Peninsula Rotary Club, thank you so very much for honoring me this evening. It's been a wonderful night. I am lucky, I feel so lucky to have the job that I do. As my student wrote in Japanese, kairu, return. My job experiences return twofold. Our next school will be recognized as Mira Lesson Intermediate School. California Distinguished School with an enrollment of 883 students. Here to present the award is our energetic and exciting principal, Kevin Allen. <laughs> So, let me see, six minutes, that's a minute and a half for me and four and a half for you. Okay. All right. I do want to say that the definition of a great teacher is the ability to inspire their students outside of the walls of the classroom. And anybody that knows Campbell Nimick can know that he does that every single day. If you could see a pack of eighth grade boys who just created four varieties of chapstick <laughs> in their STEM class, running around the campus, asking for their favorite flavors from all their friends and their principal, I have two of the flavors in my pocket. It was pretty cool to watch them become so excited about learning. Campbell also is our teacher, our shop teacher, industrial arts teacher for the only middle grades industrial arts program in the South Bay and we're really proud of that. He's also our STEM teacher and he has robotics clubs that meet in his classroom at lunch. He gives of his time, he gives of his energy, and he gives of his talent. And our students and our staff are the benefactors of his abilities and his energy and we appreciate you so much. So Campbell, come on up and be recognized. Yeah.
Good evening. Um, first, let me thank the Rotary Club uh, for this amazing event and Kevin Allen for this generous introduction there. Um, although I need to tell you that receiving this award may have caused the premature death of several of my old teachers <laughs> who I tortured in Ireland as a youth. I'm having a big week. I turned 50 on Monday. Yeah. On Tuesday, I got a couple of grants, and today I'm at this. This is uh, gonna be hard to follow for the rest of the week. <laughs> I realize I love what I do. Uh, I love trying to excite kids uh, and my students about learning. I want that switch to turn on, but I really didn't take a direct path here. Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. The dots have connected for me. But it's only because of some amazing people that that's happened, and I didn't realize the dots were happening at that time. Bill Hawks uh, gave me an opportunity to work at an engineering company, Ralph M. Parsons in Pasadena. I was totally underqualified for the job. Um, and I was supposed to be a piping designer. But to actually keep the job, I had to show up on a Saturday morning with 10 other 20-somethings uh, and be taught by this guy, Bob Pilardi. Poor Bob had to try to convince 10 20-somethings to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, God bless him, he did a great job, but uh, when I left Parsons, I really never thought that I would actually use some of the material that I was taught, um, and yet it was one of those dots. Um, Mike McDonald uh, worked with me at Merrill Lust, and uh, when he was retiring, he came to me and he said, would you be interested in, in running my woodshop program? Uh, I want to keep it running. And I was not sure about that. He said, come and see this program you'll find that kids love this. They, they love to be challenged by this type of work. And I realized what Mike was doing, it wasn't really woodshop at all. He, he was actually teaching design, and he was teaching drafting. And I realized that I could bring computer-assisted drafting into this program, and it would make it something special, something different than just woodshop. It was another dot. Uh, I need to thank Pat Corwin, who's not here tonight, because he hired me, I'm not sure why. <laughs> to John Letcher and Susan Liberati, who are also not here, they also saw something in me that gave me opportunities that I didn't really expect. And they, through good fortune, put me in the STEM program. And I am now the STEM teacher, which is science, technology, engineering, and math uh, at Merrill West. And it is amazing. I have kids building bridges and robots and underwater robotic vehicles and printing on 3D printers and fighting to come into my room, because I have the coolest stuff. <laughs> I have that cool stuff, by the way, because of these ladies over here from the Peninsula Education Foundation who have made it so worthwhile. <laughs> it's really fun to do what I do, and every day and every lesson I try to excite kids about what they're doing. But I also want to challenge them, because my class is hard. I want them to realize what they're doing in the class is actually something that they can use in the real world. And out there are these amazing opportunities with amazing companies that are looking for people that have skills that they can have. And they do not have to be the genius in the class, because they have those skills. Um, I would not either have got to this spot without a lot of help and encouragement. Um, some of that comes from my mother, who's seated over here. She made sure I received a quality education, whether I liked it or not. There was a lot of not. Uh, my, my father's also seated there, and he taught me another thing which I instill on kids, and that is that you do not get anything without hard work. Nothing is ever easy. And he gave me a rare opportunity that I've had to get all the dots filled in. My wonderful wife is here. She puts up with me working late, encourages me when I am down, and uh, keeps me pointed in the right direction, because sometimes I wander off. Um, I also need to thank all of these amazing teachers of Merrill Estra here uh, because 
They remind me every day what it's like to be a good teacher because they are all great educators. In many ways, I'm an accidental teacher. I didn't set out initially to have this as my career. I think that it was mentioned earlier from David Letterman's list. Number nine put me off. <laughs> but maybe the journey here has caused me to appreciate what I do even more because the dots have connected for me and I really want to connect the dots for my students. I try not to let words go to my head, but uh, I was wondering what to wear for this so that people would know I was a winner. <laughs> and, and I have the whole year, so I happen to be at an event, and uh, look, I'm the STEM teacher. It was a solar house event, and they were passing out plans for the solar house. But if you actually fold them perfectly, and I may have crushed it here, only STEM people would think of these things. Whoops. You actually create a small Scandinavian crown for yourself, which you can wear as Educator of the Year. <laughs> Uh, I'm an avid cyclist, so I was hoping at this point the podium girls would be coming up. Uh, and there'd be a really big chat, like at the Tour de France. <laughs> but I, I don't see any of those. I, I, uh, so I guess at, at this point I'm not retiring. Uh, I can only say to you thank you very much, and thank you for the award. Uh, it's an honor to teach. I reminded him I do not compare to the <coughs> women of the Tour de France. And our next presenter represents St. John Fisher, a wonderful kindergarten grade three school in Rancho Palos Verdes with an enrollment of 239 students. Presenting the honoree from St. John Fisher is Principal Anne Marie Houdani. Thank you to Jim and Joan and the Rotary Club for this opportunity to recognize our educators. Our Educator of the Year is Alison Graff, who joined St. John Fisher School faculty as music teacher and drama coordinator in 2000. Although she had been the conductor of the St. John Fisher Parish Choir since 1997. We're blessed to have Alison on staff her list of qualifications and experience is extensive. A graduate of Occidental College, Master of Music from Yale, postgraduate studies at USC, supplemental instruction in conducting, voice, piano, and cello, and a multiple subject teaching credential, Allison is eminently gifted. Prior to coming to St. John Fisher, she was the artistic director for the South Bay Master Chorale, instructor in choral conducting at USC, adjunct professor at Irvine Valley College and Occidental College. She's been a vocalist with the USC Chamber Choir, the Donald Brenegar Singers, and many other choral groups. At St. John Fisher School, Allison teaches music once a week to each grade prepares the students for the Advent and Spring Music Festivals, directs the school choir, coordinates the school drama, and prepares the choir to compete in the Music in the Parks Festival. The children at St. John Fisher School know Allison as the lovable and friendly, kind Mrs. Graff, who in my opinion is patience personified. I know that we are extremely fortunate to have a teacher of such high caliber who is so generous with the time and encouragement she gives to students and the warmth and good humor that we, her colleagues, see each day. I'm delighted to introduce Alison as our Educator of the Year. Remarks allowed me to reflect a little on my teaching career and how I've gotten to this point in my life and in the process several random memories flash through my mind. I have a very clear memory of always wanting to be the teacher's assistant in second grade, and how I thought being able to help correct papers was about the coolest thing that anybody could possibly do. <laughs> Therefore, there couldn't be any better thing in the world than to be a teacher, right? 
Uh, I also come from a long line of teachers, as many of my fellow recipients um, do as well. My grandfather was a basketball coach, slash principal, slash superintendent of schools in little towns all over South Dakota, most notably Aberdeen. Uh, my mom was a junior high and elementary vocal music teacher in the Long Beach Public Schools for 35 years. My uncle was a junior high instrumental and briefly choral teacher in the Irvine School District for almost 40 years, so I guess I was conditioned sort of from birth. Uh, although, I distinctly remember a conversation at the Thanksgiving dinner table one year, uh, my senior year of high school. I was in the midst of submitting college applications, and if you can believe it, my application for the UC system listed computer science as my intended major. And those of you who know me are laughing heartily right now at that prospect. My uncle told me he was glad, because take it from him, I really didn't want to pursue a music uh, career. It was too unpredictable and there wasn't any money in it. Then my mom chimed in with, and take it from her, I really didn't want to be a teacher having to deal with all those unsupportive administrators and parents. Let's just say I think they were pushing the whole reverse psychology thing a lot that year. Because <laughs> what did I end up being? An elementary and junior high music teacher. All of it combined. <laughs> uh, one other memory, I had just complete, completed my undergraduate degree and began having seemingly endless arguments with my mother about going back to school immediately for a teaching credential. So I would have something to fall back on. <clears throat> I think it likely my motivation for the, my argument was fueled as much uh, by a strong desire to take a break from school, uh, but I vehemently adopted the altruistic ideology that a teaching career isn't something someone should get into as a safety measure. It should be a vocation chosen with purpose and passion. Uh, little did I realize at the time that I actually had already started down the teaching path, choosing to be a choral conductor, which uh, is what I did for my senior recital as an undergraduate, working with undergraduate singers and teaching them music. Once I had established that I really did want to teach, in fact, was already teaching, I struggled with what age I wanted to work with. I was so convinced that I wanted to work with college students because I could speak with them in common terms, more on a peer level. So I did the logical thing and enrolled in a doctoral program. I ended up teaching at St. John Fisher almost purely by chance. I had just completed my second year of employment directing the parish choir in the church when the music teacher position came open in the school. The parish music director, Grant Hungerford, was actually the one who approached me about taking the elementary grades while he took the middle school grades. I had never taught young children and was completely awed and absolutely terrified at the prospect. <laughs> Uncertain that I was doing the right thing, I said yes with great trepidation. But by the end of the year, I had discovered a new passion and joy. And to this day, I thank whatever divine intervention prompted me to overcome my fears and say yes to this new vocational direction. In the intervening years, I have been constantly amazed and amused at the similarities and parallels present in my various guises as teacher, whether my form be an adult choir rehearsal or an elementary or junior high classroom. In fact, there are Thursday night choir rehearsals where the running joke with my adult choir, whose ages span 17 to 92, um, is why am I having to say the exact same things to you that I had to say to the first grade earlier today? <laughs> uh, in my opinion, my most successful teaching scenarios have involved my being as open to learning as I want my students to be. I find the more I listen to them, learn about them, about their interests, their ways of thinking, their ways of absorbing information, the better I can develop methods of hooking them into sharing my passion for the material I'm teaching, whether it be music performance, music theory, or music history. Knowing that different people learn in different ways, I've always maintained a whatever works attitude towards teaching. Everyone is different, everyone has a different skill set and different interests, so I try to incorporate a lot of different paths toward my ultimate goal, again in terms of both general classwork and performance preparation that involve listening, writing, speaking and singing, watching videos and movement whatever, in order to give the greatest number of students ways to participate and learn that they find comfortable and engaging. I've always been a person who has been more interested in process than product. For example, there are the many of my choral colleagues who focus primarily on their performances, demanding perfection and pouring all their efforts into developing the best final product or performance they can. And I absolutely admire them for this. And many of them, they are solely performance groups, so that's absolutely what's expected. However, I am more, uh, more interested in the process because it is in the process that the greatest, most long-lasting effect on learning takes place. 
That's not to say that I don't care about getting good performances, because I do. I simply feel that the process of learning that gets us all to the final performance is much more valuable to the students in the long term. It is during this process that students learn discipline and care for their craft, that they develop their abilities to work well as a part of a team, that they are able to focus on bigger concepts such as good tone or the proper way to produce it, balance, which involves being able to multitask and listen while one's singing, uh, memorization techniques, etc., skills which can be applicable to situations and subjects beyond the music curriculum. I have been so blessed. The support of my colleagues and principal is vital to helping me bring these op um, offerings to fruition. While I am secure in the knowledge that I have their support, I am well aware I don't always make things easy for them. When I interrupt their regular curricular schedules with added rehearsals as performances get near, or when they have to stay twice a year at the end of a long week to sit with their classes at all school music programs, I've taken to calling myself the problem child, as I am usually the one who brings up scheduling issues, the one who tells the kids, no, you can't come to volleyball practice or the student council meeting, you have to come to choir day because we have a performance next week. So to my colleagues, I say a huge mea culpa and thank you for all the times in the past I may have stepped on your toes or inconvenienced you. I really wish I could promise it won't happen again in the future, but it probably will, sorry. <laughs> um, on the flip side of that, however, I must also say how grateful I am to my colleagues for being so willing to work with me on special cross-curricular projects, whether it be music of the California missions with the fourth grade, or colonial music and dance with the fifth grade, or music of the Holocaust and jazz history with the eighth grade. Um, I wholeheartedly believe it is critical for the students to see that music does not exist in a vacuum, that it is a reflection of the culture of a particular time and particular people affected by places and historical events. And that relates to math, science, social studies, art, physical education, politics, literature. So even if a student is not into performing, per se, there is so much about music that can pique their interest. Finally, I've just spent a little time musing about what it means to be a successful teacher particularly for someone like me who sees their students in class only once a week. I know with these time constraints that I have to pick and choose carefully what I want to focus on each week. And over the past 13 years, I have determined the following definition of success for myself. Do the kids love music? Do they seek musical opportunities outside of school? Can they acknowledge all the ways in music impacts their lives on a daily basis? Can they listen to and appreciate different styles of music, live or recorded, whether they end up liking the music or not? The answer to any of these questions is yes then I will have achieved my ultimate goal as a music teacher, to develop an abiding appreciation for music in my students and inspire them. Thank you. Thank you. I am actually the program chair for the Rotary Club in our regular meetings, and in our last regular meeting, we honored one of the really young, great coaches at PV High School. So when I, when I came to the meeting, I, I saw him and I said, Derek, who, who's that young guy with you wearing that athletic shirt? He said, that's our principal, Dr. Charles Park. <laughs> anyway, here he is, Dr. Charles Park, Charles Park High School. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Having a great time. Thank you. It's an honor to stand here. Love my job. Love Palos Verdes. Rotary, high school, and district. Jim Whalen is our Teacher of the Year for PBHS. He was, he was chosen by his peers and colleagues, which speaks volumes about who he is. Peers say that he is a leader, a motivator, and a hard worker. A good example of this was last month at our Avid Car Wash, a fundraiser to support a college access program where Jim washed 30 plus cars single-handedly. <laughs> He doesn't mind rolling up his sleeves and literally getting dirty to get the job done. Jim grew up in New York and spent his undergraduate years at Boston College and received his JD from Fordham. He was a big time lawyer before he found his true calling in teaching. And as a first year principal, I am lucky to have Jim on staff because he brings everyone together to accomplish big tasks. So a couple of weeks ago, I had the, the pleasure of walking the peer-to-peer -peer PEF friendship walk. Uh, with Jim and his two sons, Kyle and Ryan, they're right there, still awake. <laughs> and I said to Ryan, I said, you know, your dad is a really cool guy. I'm lucky to work with him. And to that, Ryan said, oh, I know, because he's teacher of the year. <laughs> 
So along with Ryan, his family, friends, and colleagues, I'd like to introduce to you Jim Whalen. Come on up. Thank you, Dr. Park, for that warm introduction, most of which was true. <laughs> Somewhat embellished. Thank you. To date myself, I feel like I'm uh, on the set of This Is Your Life because so many of the people I care about are here tonight, so I want to thank them for, for coming. To give you an idea of uh, a little bit of the sick mind that I have, I was hoping to beat out the uh, co-teachers of the year here tonight, but then uh, I realized I was clearly outdone and I, I can't make a crown with, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how you did that, <laughs> nor can I whistle with two fingers and nor did I birth a child yesterday. <laughs> Certainly not a whole child. <laughs> if it's okay with you, I'm going to do three things in my speech tonight. One, say a few thank yous and acknowledge a few people. That's the bulk of my speech. Then we'll go quickly to number two and briefly tell you about the best monetary investment I ever made. By the way, Twitter IPO tomorrow. And uh, three, share the secret of my success as a teacher. I know you're dying for that one. <laughs> Thank you to the Rotary Club for putting this together. As uh, Walker Williams mentioned, these kinds of events don't happen by accident, so thank you so much. Uh, I want to also thank the uh, wonderful teachers I had growing up. This uh, week especially, I was remembering my English teacher, my sen senior year English teacher, Mr. DeLorme, who tore my college essay to shreds. It, need, it needed it. And I'm uh, paying back my own students in kind, writing their, <laughs> writing their essays and cr critiquing their uh, essays. With love, of course. Education starts at, at the home, as I think you'd all agree, and I want to thank my wonderful parents. My mom, as people have mentioned here, um, it has an education background. She was an elementary school teacher, and my dad is, uh, was a police officer for 31 years, so public service uh, is in my blood, to use Mindy's words there. My grandpa was a uh, high school dropout, yet he was the smartest man I have ever known, and a voracious reader, and he passed down his love of learning to me, so I thank him for that. My wife, who's here, is clearly the best thing that ever happened to me, and our boys, Ryan, Kyle, and Brady are here tonight, and you all mean the world to me, thank you. Thank you, thank you. My mother-in-law, Kathy, is uh, as supportive as can be, and she's here as well. My father-in-law, Peter Chang, passed away this spring, but he's here in spirit, and he supported me immensely as I transitioned from law to education. Thank you, Peter. I want to thank Chris Bowles, who took a chance in hiring me 10 years ago. That's another story, but uh, time is limited. <laughs> Speaking of administration, I want to thank, once, once again, we're blessed this year to have great admin and uh, thank Tristan Ramirez. She's amazing. And, and Dr. Park, thank you guys. I want to thank Evan Fujinaga, who uh, foolishly gives me the reins to coach freshman baseball every year at Palisbury's High School. He's here tonight. He uh, is a guy that you can turn to for great advice, and he's an undervalued valued commodity. At, in PVP USD. Great guy. Thank you, Rebecca Kelly, for bringing me on to AVID. Thank you, Jennifer Egan, who has coordinated AVID for the past seven years and is amazing at what she does. Alex Morales came onto the team uh, two years ago and has been at PV High for five years. We sort of uh, imp do impromptu team teaching because our rooms are connected, and I think the kids enjoy that. Uh, he's a personal trainer of mine as well. Alex Broughton, who comes to my house every Sunday morning, whether I need it or not. Gaylene Lancy rounds out the Avid staff, and also here tonight is Lewis Harley, Jason Calazar, Jim Warren, Tammy Sheridan, about to birth a whole child. <laughs> Barbara Ferraro, Derek Larkins, and Paul Stapleton, thank you guys for your friendship and for also laughing at my occasional reply all to staff emails. <laughs> They're not that funny. 
Former principal Chris Bowles would always say he hired teachers who viewed working at Palos Verdes High School as more than a job. As you can see from my thank yous and acknowledgments, the PVHS, PVHS staff feels that way. The fact that 10 or more of my colleagues would come out tonight on a school night shows how united our staff is and how we are not just colleagues, but uh, consider ourselves close friends and extended family. I want to thank the Board of Education for supporting the AVID program. The AVID program is a remarkable program and PVH, PV, at PVHS it has been wildly successful. That's in, thanks in part to a lot of people here, including the Klein family, the Shinazi family, the Smiths. Great, great parents. The AVID team. Well, I have eaten up a chunk of my time with thank yous. My boss, <laughs> Dr. Park, encouraged me to tell you about my background, so I always listen to my boss. So I'll keep this uh, to a brief story, which also brings me to part two of my speech. And remember, part one was the bulk. <laughs> And that's the single best monetary investment I ever made. My wife is so nervous right now. <laughs> she has no idea what's coming. The single greatest investment I ever made was $100,000 spent over three years for tuition, room, and board at Fordham University School of Law. And by the way, despite what Dr. Park said, I was a terrible lawyer. <laughs> Thanks anyway, Dr. Park. And was probably on my way to uh, costing some mal practice insurance company a lot of money so in law school I met my wife Doris on the first day of law school and while I studied here and there I spent much of the first year and a half trying to get that woman to date me <laughs> the remaining year and a half of law school which is three years was spent convincing her to stay with me and so for a hundred thousand dollars well spent I ended up being that California girl's New York souvenir. <laughs> the I Love You New York shirt, you guys know those, right? Cost $10, but I was free. So uh, that was a smart investment on your part, babe, to choose me. Thank you. <laughs> and we now have three wonderful boys. Love you guys. Which brings us to uh, part three of the speech here. Mercifully, right, guys? I transitioned from that uh, amazing legal career I had. And when I moved to California, I started teaching English as a second language in Koreatown for three years, and I just absolutely fell in love with teaching. It was amazing. So my secret to success um, in being a teacher, you know, it's funny, in the beginning, when I first started teaching, I just um, remember thinking, I need this, I need the perfect lesson plan and I need to say the math in just the right way so they understand it. <laughs> Some teachers are laughing, yeah. It, it, that's not really it. <laughs> and I was also thinking perfectly straight rows and quiet students, so. <laughs> right, right. So you soon find out that uh, that's not it at all. And um, while well, we had a uh, staff development day this, um, this, uh, this year, at the beginning of the year, uh, we read an article that talks about people who visit their doctor don't always follow the medical advice that the doctor's given. And the most likely you are to follow the advice of a medical doctor is if you trust him or her. And so that's the, the biggest thing. It doesn't matter how competent or incompetent your doctor is. If they have good bedside manner, and you believe in what the doctor is saying, you're going much more likely to follow it. And so I found that is really the true key to teaching, just to make those personal connections with the kids. And you know, we're on a block, and uh, the kids can't imagine two hours of algebra two, and nor can I. And so you have to uh, <laughs> you have to uh, talk about topics of the day, Twitter IPO, and uh, today is Pat Tillman's birthday, by the way. God bless him and uh, God bless America, and I think I'll end up my speech on that day. Thank you. Founded in 1933, Marymount is now in its fourth year as a four-year independent multi-campus
Canada's institution of higher education and has a fallen, had a fall enrollment of 1,030 students. Here to present the award is Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Ariane Schauer. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here this evening and share not just the evening, but the visible manifestation of our shared educational mission. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Last year, I stood here as a representative of the K through 16 journey that, that we provide here uh, in the community. And today, with uh, graduate programs launched and an MBA approved for next year, I am honored to represent Marymount California University. And I invite you to cont contemplate the possibilities for a K through MBA or K through Masters of Leadership options available right here in our community. So we keep growing and we keep looking around ourselves, uh, around in the community and um, all the different ways in which we support learning and growth and it's a pleasure to, to share this evening. Our honoree tonight has had a long and distinguished career at Marymount and was honored by his peers as Educator of the Year. He received this honor at the same time as he made the decision to retire from Marymount and to teach us what retirement and the next phase of learning can look like. It is very nice to be here tonight and to see John Perkins surrounded by colleagues. John joined Marymount in 1979 and held many positions at the college, including Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies, Department Chair, Philosophy and Religious Studies, Director of Summer and Winter Terms, Faculty Senate President. He led students on study abroad trips, and he served on countless committees, including the Honors Committee, the Curriculum Committee, the Budget Committee, and the President's Cabinet. I worked most closely with John when he served as Faculty Senate President. It was, in fact, John who encouraged me to accept a nomination for VP of Faculty Senate, a role that I just could not imagine at the time, and that has propelled me into a whole chain of new responsibilities. This is just one example of John's ongoing commitment to student development, faculty development, and the values of a liberal arts education. Please welcome Professor John Perkins. Thank you and good evening. Three thanks are in order. Professor Schauer for a nice introduction. My colleagues at Marymount for this honor. The Chamber of Commerce, oh, Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary Club for its continued support of, of teaching. Uh, as a philosopher, I'm pretty much obsessed with the notion of purpose. And so tonight I thought I would uh, share a few quick thoughts within a couple of minutes on why is it that we're all here? Uh, we have our own little anecdotal stories, but after all is said and done, what brings us in common to the table? And so I thought I'd, I would spend a few minutes talking about the purpose of education. <clears throat> a clue to the purpose of education comes from, of all places, parents. Caring parents often say, yes, I want my child to have a good life. That is, good health, a nice home, nice car, and so forth. But sooner or later they say something like, but above all else, I want my child to be a good person. From preschool through college, children spend a great deal of their time in formal education. So with the help of both the family and the community, the purpose of education is not just to develop persons with knowledge. The purpose of education is to help develop good persons. Indeed, knowledge is not sufficient to establish that a person is educated. I'll say that again. Knowledge is not sufficient to establish that a person is educated. Rather, in addition to knowledge, it is who the person is and what the person does with his or her knowledge that are the marks of an educated person. We spend an enormous amount of time on testing for knowledge, but as Francis Bacon realized, knowledge is just power. Without the proper moral character to guide that knowledge, the, the person with knowledge is just power on the loose. As Theodore Roosevelt recognized, to educate in mind and not in morals is to educate and menace to society. To develop good persons, something other than, than knowledge is needed. Knowledge is simply not sufficient for action. That something else that is needed is moral character. To educate the whole person, we must, as Roosevelt said, 
educate for, for knowledge and educate for goodness. Knowledge-wise, we need qualified engineers, business persons, doctors, lawyers, plumbers, mechanics, teachers, administrators, and so forth. But character-wise, we need those qualified engineers, business persons, doctors, lawyers, and so forth to be good persons. So graduation next year, when you see a student walk across the stage, ask yourself, is that student really educated? That is, do not just ask how much knowledge he or she has, but also ask what sort of moral character have we helped to develop in that student? It truly makes all the difference in the quality of the good life for everyone, not just that particular student. Thanks very much. Here comes Peter McCormick. He's headmaster of Rolling Hills Prep School. One of, our, one of our Rotary meetings, he delivered a 30 minute presentation in French. No one in the Rotary Club speaks French, so we thought his French was flawless. We wouldn't have known a flaw if he'd made a flaw. Peter McCormick. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, in, in the interest of time, you know we're last. Uh, Brian and I have just been talking. Uh, we decided we'd flip the classroom tonight. I've just loaded our speeches down onto the internet, onto a Google Doc, and you can all go home and read them. <laughs> and we'll see you back here at 8 o'clock in the morning to discuss. <laughs> My name's Peter McCormack. I'm the head of school at Rolling Hills Prep and the Renaissance School of Arts and Sciences. When I took up my job, we were just one school at the time, the board chair whispered to me that we might have someone on our staff who would become our first athletic director. Brian Niggin, the board chair told me, was a talented young basketball coach. So far, so good. He'd been with us for a few months. Hmm. And he was driving down to Palos Verdes and back every day from Monterey Park. Uh oh, how long is he going to be with us? And Brian was a Mets fan. Now I'd just come off of uh, seven years in Boston and seen that World Series win trickle agonizingly through Bill Butner's legs. Strike three. But I took a chance on him anyway. Although basketball was and always will be Brian's first love, he's built the entire athletics program from three teams to 25 in the 21 years he's now been with us. We've been able to maintain our no-cut policy in all sports with approximately 61% of students in both schools playing on teams. I happen to know that it's that stat that Brian is most proud of, notwithstanding the CIF titles we've accumulated on the way. They are just icing on the cake. Just an athletic director? I don't think so. Add to that role teacher, coach, advisor, senior speech coordinator, director of alumni affairs, husky dad, husky alumni dad, future husky grandfather. I think you get the picture. He's a true believer in what we're doing to change lives at our two schools. And how many times have the, wet, the Mets won it all since the 80s? I believe the Red Sox have won it twice. Oh. Three times. In both baseball and hiring decisions, I rest my case. Brian Niggin. Thank you, Peter, the PV Rotary Club, my colleagues who I love dearly and my family who are here sharing this special night with me. When most people think about an educator, they immediately picture a classroom, a teacher standing in front of attentive students. They envision a pristine room with desks neatly in a row and bookshelves filled with educational materials. My classroom is very different. In my classroom, you'll see mud, dirt, blood, sweat, and tears. My classroom might have grass or hardwood floors. It has nets and goalposts. In my classroom, bells don't ring, whistles shriek. 
You raise your hand to high five a teammate and you celebrate loudly and with emotion. This is my classroom and I am so thankful to work in that type of environment. The interesting thing is, my classroom and the so-called classrooms that are traditional are very much alike. Academic learning and athletics are complements of each other. Athletics not only teaches students to maintain physical fitness, but so much more. They teach the habit of obedience, discipline, determination, to maintain willpower, the power of reasoning, and mental development. Therefore, I believe it is fair and accurate to say Athletics, along with academics, results in mental, moral, and physical development of students. To put this theory to test, at Rolling Hills Prep and Renaissance Schools, students try every day to live by our four pillars. Disciplined minds, sound character, healthy bodies, and creative spirits. When you look closely at this, I believe athletics, when taught and coached properly, provides one of the most powerful avenues to fulfillment of these four pillars. Discipline minds are needed when a golfer is staring down an eight-foot putt to win a match with an impossible break to read, or the basketball player who must drown out the screaming crowd as he attempts a game-winning free throw, or the cross-country runner who is physically and mentally exhausted but must give that final kick at the end of a three-mile race. Sound character is needed after an emotional last-second loss when you must shake hands and congratulate your opponent. To put your arms around a teammate who might have just cost you a win and encourage them and thank them for their effort and commitment to team. You must be able to show restraint when an official or referee has obviously missed a crucial call that might lead to a defeat. Creative spirits are needed for the coach who must keep practices lively and fun in the middle of a long and arduous season. For the quarterback who must improvise at the line of scrimmage because the play from the sideline is not going to work with the defense he sees in front of him. Or the soccer player who has been practicing that special move and uses it when the game is on the line to score the winning goal. And most importantly, healthy bodies. Today's generation of electronics-obsessed children are fighting the worst obesity epidemic in history. Giving kids an excuse to exercise is reason enough to consider sports. Playing sports is energy put to good use. Thus, sports provides the body with complete exercise, and engaging in sports directly translates into overall fitness and academic success. In closing, I must give credit to the real heroes in my life, my team. An athletic department is run by a group of committed people, not one person. My team is the reason our school's athletic department runs smoothly and effortlessly. First, my coaches. They are a group of incredible people who spend far too much time away from home to give our students the athletes the experience they deserve. A dedicated, thoughtful, and skilled coach can have an amazing impact on children. The kids have early positive experiences with coaches, they continue to seek out and learn from mentors who can help them with schools, jobs, and other interests. Our students have that, and I am so thankful for them. I'd like to thank my administration, Peter, Ryan, and Heidi, and all of my wonderful colleagues and teachers for all they do for our student athletes. My administration has shown unbelievable support to me, and our athletes have always given me the go-ahead to implement new programs and new ideas. And our teachers are just amazing, flexible, committed professionals who make things so much easier for our athletes by understanding the time commitment involved in extracurricular activities. And they work with them, not against them. And finally, I'm last, so I know that's very music to your ears. And finally, I must thank my amazing family. First, my daughters, Deja Ned, class of 2000, and Ariana, who's a junior. No kid should spend as much time at a gym feel or track as those who had to endure. <laughs> when dad had to go to a game, meeting, or school function, they were there with me, arriving home late and having to wake up, er, up early and do it all over again the next day. Through it all, they never complained or used their schedules as an excuse to be unsuccessful in school, athletics, or their social lives. They compromised and support me in what I am doing, and I love them with all my heart. Next, my son, Dimitri, who did not attend school with me, and was shortchanged on my time far too often. A fine athlete in his own right, when he had games and playoff appearance, so did I, so therefore, I kind of missed many of those special moments. He never complained, he always supported me, and understood I could not be there. I will say he was my good luck charm, though. In my five CIF final championship games that I was lucky enough to coach in, he was right there on the bench with 
of me serving as my ball boy, and he and I went five and together. Those were priceless memories. And last but certainly not least, the team captain of my team, my wife of 22 years, Doreen. It's not easy being married to a coach. We go home late, cranky, upset, tired, and that's when we win. <laughs> She's the architect of our family success, keeping everything together in the middle of playoffs, close games, and constant late night events. Doing this while juggling her own very successful career and time consuming job. She's my number one fan and my number one critic. Thank you for your support and love. I couldn't do any of it without you. Thank you. To my right and to my left are long tables filled with beautiful certificates and commendations from civic and governmental entities honoring each of this year's Educators of the Year. Please take a moment to look at these, and we invite each honoree to be sure to come forward and gather your certificates as well as the box for your camera that holds the little battery. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a lovely evening. I hope you are as impressed as I am with the talent and dedication of each of these outstanding educators. Let's please give them another round of applause. <laughs> On behalf of the Rotary Club of Palos Verde Peninsula, we so appreciate your wonderful support and attendance at this very special community event. Thanks so much and good evening. Very special thanks to the Palace Verdes Peninsula Rotary Club and congratulations to all of our teachers here on the peninsula. I'm Maria Sorreo and we'll see you next time. <laughs>